Um, so I'm going to talk for about 20, 25 minutes um, about a project that we've been running at Manchester Metropolitan University um, in collaboration with the local secondary school, which kind of picks up on some of the theoretical things that I've been thinking about recently around failure and why it is that we don't really let our students fail. Um, so this came about um, kind of from three different areas and three different interests of mine. So, um, as I said, I've been very interested in this kind of theoretical idea of learning through failure. Um, and I see this very much in our own students and my own time at university. So I do remember when I was a student that actually failing and being kicked out of your year was an absolute option. Um, now I've never seen a student in any of the institutions I've worked at fail for plagiarising for anything. It's, it's not something that I think we really, um, is, is really something that students think about. Um, I also think that failure is really, really important. So for me, when I regularly fail to get papers accepted, to get funding proposals accepted, um, I see those as learning experiences. And I kind of worry that we're not really giving students that kind of opportunity to, to accept and laud positive failure. So one of the things that I've been thinking about is in terms of my work around games and play is a construct called the magic circle. And the idea of the magic circle is that it's a safe space in which you can fail. Now, video games use this all the time. Um, people play video games because the failure is intrinsic in them. If you could play a video game and we're going to get it right first time, it would be really boring. It's that cycle of failure, reconstruction, learning through failure that's really important in terms of video games. So I've been thinking for a while about how you could take this kind of learning through failure model and apply it ethically and safely within higher education. Um, a recent other um, interest of mine is escape rooms. So can I just get a show of hands of how many people have played an escape room here? So about half, and, and how many people know what an escape room is? So, okay, so who doesn't know what an escape room is? Okay, so the idea is, and this I, I've seen looks on people's faces of absolute horror, um, is in an escape room you and a number of other people, usually two, three or four, uh, are locked in a room, often not really physically locked in, um, and you have to solve a series of puzzles over the course of an hour or so to get out of the room. Um, and I first played this with a bunch of learning technologists down in London about four years ago, and all four of us came out going, wow, that's absolute, there's something about the time and the physicality and the being locked in a room and having to work with other people and having to collaborate, it was really powerful. Um, and over the last four years, there's some really interesting work that's been done around using escape rooms for education. Andrew Walsh at the University of Huddersfield has done some amazing stuff around escape rooms for libraries. Um, Helen Whitehead has done some sort of online escape room work. Um, Liz Cable at Leeds Trinity is an absolute master of the field in terms of getting, she has boxes and boxes of this kind of escape boxes that I know she carries around in her car and the students absolutely engage with that. Um, and Samantha Clark, particularly at the University of Coventry, is doing some really good theoretical thinking around what might escape rooms for learning look like. Um, and that, that was the kind of original space that I was thinking in. But we worked um, from 2012 to 2014. I was uh, involved in a project called Magical, which was looking at um, how we could get children in years seven, eight, and nine in high school to engage in collaborative learning through digital game making. Um, and this really opened my eyes to the kind of power of collaboration and in terms of skills such as problem solving, um, collaborative learning, teamwork, creativity, um, and just kind of lateral thinking and thinking outside the box. Now, whilst the outcomes of that project were, were generally positive, one of the big issues that we had was around the technical provider, the ability to have game-making software, the ability then to take that software and use it on different machines. It was basically a lot of technical issues. And for me, that's when it all came together of thinking about what can we do to learn through failure, how could I do something cool with escape rooms, and how could we build on the principles of learning through game-making that we developed in this previous project. And it came from a chance conversation with, us, with um, one of our ex-students who happens to be a senior maths teacher at a local school, and me saying, I'd really like to do something with escape rooms and failure, and him saying, well, I've got a bunch of really good sixth formers, and they're doing an enrichment project, they've got an enrichment week, and we don't know what to do with them. So, um, I forgot to use my slides. <laughs> That's, um, 
Excellent. I've just got two embedded in talking that I forgot to, to actually use my slide. So that's my slide. That's just um, the point I'm just making about failure. So I will move on from that. And um, so this is this was talking about the magical project. So the, the um, this is when the Edgescapes project was born. And we've actually run it for three years in collaboration with a high school in Cheadle Hume, which is just about five miles south of Manchester. Um, in the second year, we got some funding, um, some Erasmus Plus network funding um, from a consortium called Learning Games, which is really nice because that's given us the opportunity to take some ideas and build on them with international partners. Um, the big problem with it has been fitting it into curriculum. Despite having um, a head of uh, a, a senior person in the university who's totally committed to the project, um, because it's with students who are halfway, it's the, their AS level year, um, the curriculum by that point is so full that there's very limited spaces in terms of being able to fit in something that's cross-curricular and something that teaches these kind of failure-based skills. So in the first year, we had 12 students who were pretty much cherry-picked because it was a bit of an experiment. Um, for, and they developed escape rooms during the two-week enrichment period. Uh, in year two, based on feedback from the first time, we used a smaller one-week enrichment period. Um, and it worked both times. Um, and, and we got a lot of very good feedback. But the issue for me was that it was very much the best students, the brightest and the best. We had a small cohort. We had thrown a lot of resource into it. And I was very interested to see whether it was something that could be expanded beyond kind of the best 12 in the, in the school. So based on, on our funding for um, the Learning Games project, we decided in the final year that we would go for a different model. So instead of ha having it pushed into an enrichment period, we'd run it as a, an optional work experience type um, activity, one hour a week over six months, and we'd open it up to 40 students. So we'd have a much different student demographic and see if we could, which was much more representative of the types of um, ideas we were looking at. I mean, it's all very well to have a model that works very well, but if it's not inclusive, there's not a great deal of point. And what I wanted to talk to today is kind of the ideas and models that came from that and some of the findings of the research that we've done. So this is the sort of model of failure-based learning that it was built around, with three key areas. First being initiation, development, and then presentation. Um, and the idea of this with the, in the, in the initiation period, it's about introducing students to the escape rooms and about giving them the opportunity to make build up their teams. So we take them to a commercial escape room and play games with them. So each the teams that are going to work together actually go and work through um, an escape room. Um, we've then developed a kind of tra training program, which starts with looking at how you design puzzles, the different types of puzzles you might use, and looking at um, how you then would go through the steps to put um, an escape room together. In the first two years, we run this, ran this as a single day. In the, pre in the last year, we run this over the course of, of the first month of the project and getting people together. Um, and, and that's very much about taking time to team build, to scene set, um, and to make sure that students know what they're aiming at. Then we have this kind of fail, failure-based development phase. And the whole point of getting out of an escape room is that you're designing something for other people, and you, you're never going to get it right first time. And that's absolutely fine. That's part of an accepted part of the process. Um, but you will have to test it, and you'll have to test it over and over again. And that seeing how other people interact with your puzzles and with your theme is part of, of the learning experience. So this cycle of test it, fail it, um, reflect, revise is absolutely integral. And one of the things we say to students is that there will be different phases of it. So generally we'll say, come up with your theme and then come up with your puzzles. Test all of your puzzles and test them again. Watch other people doing it. Get other people to think aloud while they're working through it. Because what we've found is that teams will come up with something they think is really obvious and people solve it, just don't get it, or something that they think is really difficult that people solve straight away. So it's, that sort of process is absolutely crucial. Um, so they will test it with the teachers, um, they'll test it with their other students and other groups, uh, and then a couple of times during the period we'll send in people from the university. So again, I, I've sort of 
brought in friends who are game developers or pro professionals, and it's that kind of bringing a professional in and giving them the sort of professional feedback that's been quite key to it. Um, and then finally, um, there's, a, there's an event. Now, we run the Playful Learning Conference, which runs every year in July, and for the last three years, we've brought these students in, given them conference passes, they've been part of the conference, but also they've been running the escape rooms for the delegates at the end of the conference. And this has been the really key moment for them. At the end of last year, we had students going, I didn't realize it was a real thing, and, and suddenly they'd stepped up because they, they'd had this new level of professionalism because there was this professional presentation at the end. So while it's absolutely key to this that there isn't kind of a, an assessment, this presentation is, is the point at which actually you've done all your failing and then you've got a big public celebration at the end and that's been very important for the students. Um, now, one of the reasons for kind of going into physical, the physical escape rooms is to get away from the problems that we'd have when we were um, game building with um, digital games. But actually, there are lots and lots of ways that you can build technology into this. And it's been quite eye-opening the way that the students have kind of taken this and run with it themselves. So one of the, the things was using digital puzzles, so using various types of electronics. So there have been puzzles that have been around unlocking iPads, finding codes. Um, one of the groups in the first year built this amazing electronic box with internal circuitry that you had to put, plug in three various things at different points and it would open the box. I think it allows for lots of creativity in terms of digital as well as physical and mechanical puzzles. Um, I was quite surprised in how many of the groups got really creative in terms of scene setting. So they put their theme. We had one group that had ambient music running at different points along with different puzzles. Lots of groups that went to a lot of trouble producing videos that would allow people to go come to do kind of do the scene setting for them. So there's a lot of creativity there. But one thing that we ask groups to do when people are in the room, there has to be a way of monitoring them. So we've got groups who've set up GoPros, who've set up various camera solutions, and ways of getting information. So some have used um, different types of computers or ways, laptops and tablets and, and ways of digital ways of um, getting information to participants. On the other example, we've had some groups that have had a physical person in the room and use that as a way. So it allows you to be as digital as you want. Equally, you can go completely analog. And we've also been quite impressed with the kind of project management tools and different digital tools that students have used in terms of being able to design their room, being able to test their room, being able to monitor and reset their rooms really quickly. A lot of them have done that digitally. So what I like about this is it doesn't, you could do the whole thing without engaging in digital at all. You could do, make it a very, very high tech digital room, but it allows groups to engage in the digital as much or as little as they want to. So for this final year, we uh, ran some more structured research around the project. So this, this kind of had three questions and three different types of data that we were looking at. So we were interested in student learning, and we hypothesized that student learning would be around team building, that it would be, sorry, was that a time thing? That it would be around collaboration, that it would be around creativity and problem solving. So we used a post and a pre evaluation. Now, obviously, we didn't have a control group, so the, the significance that we could get from this was fairly limited anyway, but I was interested in whether they, things around their, their confidence in these areas were going to change. As it happened, what we learned from this is that students won't fill out a post questionnaire once they've left the project, and so we've got very limited data on that, but there's some quite interesting qualitative stuff coming out of that too. Um, in terms of trying to work out what the student experience, did they like it, what did they feel that they got out of it, we've got quite a lot of rich qualitative data. So we got an RA to come in and interview all of the student groups of, over the one day of the conference that they, were, um, that they came to run their rooms at, and, we, and that's kind of the analysis that I'm going to talk about here. Um, we're also interested in the staff experience, so we do have some qualitative data from the three staff members that run the project as well, and that's backing up some of the data that I'm going to share with you. So we're at the point now of having the interview transcripts and having some of the qualitative data from the pre and a few um, post questionnaires. Um, and and we, we, we plan to do a detailed both thematic and discourse analysis on it. At the moment, we've done a very early kind of thematic analysis just, just to see what the main things that come out and I'm going to share that with you now. So um, in terms of the key findings, Something that came out this year, which didn't really happen in previous years, and which I think is to do with the size of the cohort, 
is that um, the whole process of managing failure is not easy. So despite the fact that it was always, we were very clear with students all the way along that um, you will not get this right first time, you have to accept critical feedback, this is part of the process, it's about change and iteration and refinement, um, we still, on the time, that, the first time that myself and colleagues went in to give students feedback, um, we got quite a lot of feedback from staff that the students had found it quite demotivating because we'd, we'd been critical but positive um, and that they hadn't, they hadn't been used to receiving that kind of feedback. Now, whether that's something to do with um, how, I mean, I, we weren't horrible to them, but we were very constructive in terms of this bit isn't really going to work, you're going to need to look at that again. So I think they hadn't quite been expecting that this time, whereas in previous years, they were getting much more close engagement with members of staff because it was over a shorter period of time. Um, so we're really thinking about how we set students up to accept that failure is part of the process and to manage it and to deal with it constructively and that perhaps we need to put more support in around doing that and, and more preparation for students in terms of this is, this is how, how you accept, how you, you learn from the feedback that you're being given. Um, that the structure is crucial, so coming back very strongly that the time spent in scene setting and doing initial training and support and playing um, was really key. Equally, the students really, really valued the fact that they could come to a, um, a public conference at the end and that they were engaging with the general public. Um, and what they said at the end was, actually, we want to go back and do this again. Can we go and do it to, to the, the governors and we want our parents to come in and do it? It was this, this sort of feeling of celebration for them came through very strongly. Um, but also the idea of this iterative stage. And if anything, what we didn't do was, was perhaps chunk it up more in terms of development. Because realistically, they were having to have it tested 10 times to get something good. And I don't think they had this, the feel for exactly how much of this iteration was going to have to happen. So in terms of future work, that's something we'll definitely be looking at. And the, the, the middle section needs to be much more structured. In terms of the learning outcomes, while we didn't gather any evidence on things that we did expect, there were some interesting things that came out that we hadn't expected. Um, one was very much around the kind of power relationship between the students and their teachers. Because they'd got their teachers to play the games, this had opened up this new avenue of, of oh, my teacher is doing something that I've made that they can't solve. And, and it really, the, the, I think, in terms of building the students' confidence and their ideas of what they could do, it was absolutely amazing. This came up from lots and lots of the students. This feeling of independence as well. Now this, I think, we didn't have any evidence of this in the first two years, but I think this was in the third year because it was run over such a long period of time, that they liked being trusted, that they, they really felt that they'd gone off and done a thing. Um, and I think also this idea of they really got that other people don't think like them. And I'm not sure that there'd ever be a chance to sort of see that as obviously is when you're watching somebody try and solve the thing that you've produced. Um, and several of them that I was talking to were saying, I just never thought that anyone would think like that. And it's really opened my eyes to people are different. And if I'm producing a thing, there's lots of different takes on it. So I think in terms of those learning outcomes, we were, were quite interesting that were coming out from it. So uh, where's the project going now? We've got three universities in the UK who are, quite, who are taking it and going to be using it with their students, which is great. Um, I'm really interested, if anybody else wants to take the model, we have a website, everything's available online. I'd be really interested if anybody else wants to take it and run with it with their students. Um, we've received some fund funding from Erasmus+, Plus, so it, we're going to be running a, um, a two-year project, which will be taking it into schools in six countries to try and sort of embed it. My issue with it is I think it's got a lot of potential, but it works much better with small groups and high input, whereas I think once, to, to make it valuable, it needs to be much more accessible to larger groups and, and how you can then put that into different curricula. So we're looking at six different curricula, six different countries to see how we can push it forward. So thank you very much for listening. Um, please contact me if you'd like to know anything about the project. My email's there and that's the project website. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, are they constructing escape rooms to explore a certain topic? W when they started in the first year, the colleague that I was working with was a maths teacher, um, and I'm a computer scientist, so we were interested in maths and computer science. 
Um, but it turned out that that was kind of adding another layer of complexity, that the students were finding it quite hard sometimes to come up with puzzles anyway, and that making them all maths and computer science based um, wasn't a massive problem, but it just ended up that some of them were incredibly complex and required certain prior knowledge, which is kind of against the ethos of an escape room. So in the previous, in the subsequent years, we didn't have any sort of curricula in terms of what the puzzles were about, because it was very much about cross-curricular objectives. Next one. I have a question here too. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so there's a couple of questions on the screen which kind of links what I wanted to ask too about um, being a gamer myself. I get very motivated by um, the random badges that show up on my PS4, which I wasn't necessarily working towards, but show up and, and kind of motivate me to new things and find new things in the game. I just wondered, um, given that I see badges everywhere, uh, whether you could potentially use badges here, not only for motivation, self-assessment, but also in terms of showing the things that the kids, young people have learned through failure at a distance outside of the project. Yeah. Um, I think I hadn't, that hadn't occurred to me, but now you've said it, it's ringing lots of, of bells. Um, I think part of it was why would the students do it? And, and we, we'd always said, well, it's something to tell ACAS about and that we'll give you a letter. Um, but actually, they've never come back and asked for that. I think by the end of it, they've they retrospectively kind of enjoyed the experience. I think this year, because it took so long, uh, because they were only doing it for an hour a week, there were certain points when it kind of lost its impetus and the staff had to get back in there. Now I can then see, actually, if we are putting more of a structure in, and we did that around badges, that each group has to collect certain badges at certain times, um, that would not only allow you to structure it, but it would allow you to see where you were in comparison to the other groups. And I think because there were more groups this time, the first two years, they were all working in the same spaces and there was a lot of competition between the groups. We actually ran it as a competition and gave prizes. We didn't do for various logistic reasons in the final year. Um, but actually, I think being able to see that group's done 10 iterations or that group's done, failed, you know, 20 times, could actually be really motivated. I might come talk to you about that. <laughs> um, are there any other questions in the room? Time. Um, I'll just pick up one more. If university education was a board game, would it be at £27,000? Piece of puzzle, trivial pursuit, or the beginning of a very long game of Monopoly? Or a bit of each, maybe. <laughs> um, OK, I'm, I can't see the time, but I suspect it's, it's moving onwards and everybody's wanting a bit of lunch. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you for listening. I'm around for the whole conference and very happy to talk to anyone. Well, please get in touch.
I'm John Wilson, I'm the CEO at Agenta. We're a technology company that focuses on education and learning. We build, manage and operate platforms for education, for video collaboration. Externally, we prefer to work with what we feel as ethical industries. Um, obviously education, teaching, learning, healthcare. We feel that we can really contribute to these industries by creating exciting platforms, um, easy to use platforms, secure platforms that people can utilise. What we feel is one of the most important things for Scotland to boost economic growth uh, is investing in rural areas. By investing in uh, broadband in these local areas we can attract more talent, we can attract more companies and we can drastically improve the delivery of education and learning within these schools within disparate regions within Scotland.